Now, the United States has imposed a raft of new sanctions against major Russian companies, accusing Moscow of failing to take action to de-escalate the crisis in Ukraine. Russia's biggest oil producer, Rosneft, along with Gazprom Bank, are among those targeted. Also on the list are the arms manufacturer Kalashnikov and Russia's second largest gas company, Novatech. They have now been cut off from America's financial markets, but are still able to trade as normal. Well, in response, Russia's foreign ministry has accused the US of damaging relations between the two countries. Moscow views the sanctions as blackmail and has warned of possible countermeasures. Alexei Yaroshevsky has the story. Well, these sanctions are illegal, says the Russian Prime Minister. They are unacceptable blackmail and even a revenge for U.S. failings in Ukraine, says the Russian Foreign Ministry. The Russian President, now touring Latin America, uh, says that this latest string of sanctions may have a boomerang effect on the U.S. economy. Without a doubt, these sanctions are not only damaging Russian-American relations, but also driving them to a dead end. I'm convinced that they go against the American government's and American people's own long-term interests. Moscow says it will respond to this latest string of sanctions, but its response will be made in a calm and sensible manner, unlike actions of Washington. And we are now joined live by Paul Sprague from the accounting firm Russia Consulting to discuss what these measures will actually mean in practice. Uh, thanks for joining us, Paul. Um, I'm still, I have to admit, I'm still struggling to get my head around all of this. If you could put this in the simplest possible terms, just for my benefit and others, I'm sure. Um, first of all, how will these American sanctions work? Yes, yeah, so the sanctions are, are specifically designed to put pressure on companies and individuals that the United States believes has an effect in the Ukraine conflict. Uh, the United States has prepared, as we know, a blacklist, and uh, the American companies are not allowed to do business with these Russian companies that are found on the blacklist. And that, that's essentially the basis of, of the sanctions. OK, the bit I'm still struggling to understand, I think, is that, as, as I get it, companies can still borrow money in the US. So, I mean, doesn't that mean they can still actually do business in practice? No, are you speaking of Russian companies or US companies? Russian companies. I, I assume, OK, yeah, yeah. Uh, Russian companies can continue to borrow money, provided that they're not on the list. Uh, if, a, if a Russian company is not on the list, Everything is as normal. There's, there's no changes. There's no effect to these companies that are not on the list. However, if they are on the list, then uh, American companies, American citizens, are not allowed to do business with them. Okay, and, uh, and of course, this is very disappointing. Yeah. OK, because my understanding is that the companies who are under sanctions, they are effectively still allowed to trade and, and carry out operations in America. I mean, is that the case or not the case? I'm, I'm sorry, what? Uh, my companies? understanding is that the companies who are under sanctions, they are still effectively allowed to trade, to carry out operations in America. I mean, is that the case as you, as you understand it? So, effectively not. In reality, not. There's no... Uh, they, they can carry out business in America, but they won't have any customers and they won't have any suppliers. Now, I'm talking just specifically about the listed companies, the listed Russian companies. Can, there's nothing in American legislation to prevent them from carrying out business, but in reality, they won't have any suppliers, they won't have any clients, uh, because the, the American citizens, American companies are banned from, from dealing with these, these listed companies. Okay, the short-term results so have been, a, a, bit of a, from, from, been uh, a bit of a panic in the Russian markets. I mean, that's, that's been the immediate response. Do you foresee that lasting for long? There, there's certainly, I'm, I am feeling a, a little bit of a uh, uh, sense of urgency. Um, Russia has a lot of trading partners, uh, particularly Germany, particularly the European Union. So I, I don't think the United States makes the bulk of, of Russian business. And I believe that, that in the end, uh, the Russian companies will survive and there won't be any detrimental, uh, detrimental impact in, in the long run. OK, so it sounds like what you're saying is, because I was going to ask you next, should Moscow be concerned about sort of long-term major economic losses? But it sounds like you, you don't think that's a danger. We, we would have to see what the other countries do, particularly the European Union. Uh, the European Union has a much closer relationship with Russia. And so I think there's a lot of attention on what they may or may not do. And uh, we expect to see that uh, somewhere around the end of July, the end of the month. OK. Paul Sprague, uh, Director of Russia Consulting, thanks so much to you.
Now, uh, all in all, Russia did feel the pinch of the imposed sanctions, and it was uh, pretty immediate as well. Let's find out more from RT Venture Capital host Katie Pilbeam. Uh, Katie, thanks. Hello. Another perspective on this. So how yes. has the financial sector reacted to these uh, implemented sanctions? Indeed. Well, you mentioned the panic just there, and it's all very relevant in the numbers, as we've seen. We saw a slump initially as the session opened up here in Moscow on the MySex just here. You'll be able to see the decline, and that is the, the jitters, the investor jitters. There are concerns at the moment that these problems will exacerbate. Mm -hmm. uh, we did have a sense of resilience. Uh, they did resume themselves, and at the moment they remain around 2 to 3 percent in negative territory, around 4 percent for the week. It's also the Russian ruble that's uh, a concern too. It's also lost around 1 percent against both the dollar and the euro. So you can see the dollar just here has actually gained against That's the Russian currency. That's quite a big currency. drop, isn't it, in it such is a short indeed, time? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's great for some people, for exporters or tourists that come mm -hmm. here, uh, but it is a concern as well. But the interesting thing was the European markets they remain in negative territory too. Uh, we've got a sea of red across the bourses on the continent, and that's because of the close economic partnership between Europe and Russia. And we know at the moment the US sanctions, they are partial, and it's all about the concern to do with Europe. Will they intensify theirs? OK. Um, I understand it a little bit better. Thank you very <laughs> much, Katie. Well, Washington's zeal is uh, not being matched in Europe, which is going ahead with much softer measures. Despite personal calls from Barack Obama, Brussels has decided only to suspend funding for future joint Russia-European projects. Dr Richard Wellings from the Institute of Economic Affairs says it's because the EU has a lot to lose. EU-Russian trade is about ten times the size of US-Russian trade, so clearly there are potentially massive losses from the EU imposing too stringent sanctions on Russia, particularly given the huge dependence on uh, Russian uh, energy imports in you know, countries towards the sort of eastern side of the European Union. Uh, so there's a, a big uh, difference in emphasis, and I think to an extent um, the EU is still at this stage of gesture politics where it's trying to um, if you like, uh, please the Americans, uh, but do as little as possible in reality. So I think, I think really we, we're not going to see um, you know, much action from the EU. They'll, they'll try and get away with as little as possible without really upsetting uh, the White House.